الحمد لله اسمعنا طلع الموسم في سوريا والحمد لله يعني الزراعة البعلية السنة الحمد لله بالمنطقة نشهد عنها Strikt vetenskapligt så vet vi att jordens tid är räknad. Solen kommer att expandera. Den timmeglassen är den ut där faktiskt. Ja. Vetenskapligt. Jag har ett torbol. Rösta av jufak ett jub. Det kan där tillsra ischet mig med ett jub. Men hav. Det är hub. بدلوم البشر زرع الأدوب تنصر في نار الحكوم In 2015, I read about an agricultural research center moving from Aleppo to the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon due to the escalating war in Syria. The center in Aleppo had a large gene bank, a significant collection of frozen seed samples that they were unable to relocate with them to Lebanon. And so this center, which is called ICARDA, decided to duplicate their collection by withdrawing safety backups that they were storing in Svalbard, in the Arctic Ocean, in something called the Global Seed Vault. And Svalbard is an Arctic Ocean, which is, which is under Norwegian custody in the Arctic, um, far away from mainland Norway. <clears throat> this vault is also nicknamed the Doomsday Vault, and it serves as a backup facility for thousands of gene banks across the world. The rhetoric by and around the vault frames it as a last chance to reboot or an ultimate insurance policy should the earth be hit by a major catastrophe. This transaction of seeds between two tiny spots on the earth, the Bekaa Valley and Svalbard, was the starting point for my film. The yearly life cycle of the seeds determined the shooting schedule and narrative structure. So that means the seeds withdrawal from Svalbard, then being planted in the Bekaa, watching them grow uh, during the spring, and then being harvested and threshed in the summer and frozen again in the early fall. Through this journey, the camera moves between a matrix of lives and hierarchies of labor, labor involved in the duplication of the seeds. And since we're not going to be watching the film, I thought maybe I could mention a few of these characters. <clears throat> so there's a van driver called Yusuf who transports the boxes to and from the airport. He comes from a long line of small farmers in the Bekaa, but has left farming to open a small transportation business. Yusuf laments that many farmers in the area have opted to turn their arable land into makeshift refugee camps because it has proven more profitable than farming. Then we have in the research center a database manager who indexes the collection in the seed bank. And we also meet a breeder who describes the process of creating pure seed varieties. And these scenes are interspersed by daily routine of migrant women implementing this international initiative in the Bekaa. They prefer the underpaid work in the field than sitting idle in the camps. And at some point I realized that the seeds and the women came from the same outskirts of Aleppo, but unlike the traveling seeds, they are barely allowed to leave the confines of their refugee camp. 
Some of the other characters we encounter are the directors and polit politicians in a staged media event, which you heard at the beginning of the trailer, deep inside the vault in Svalbard. We also meet a priest and scientist, <coughs> who are kind of like the comic relief in the film, pontificating about the future of the Earth and inc increasingly warmer temperatures on the Arctic island. The bank's reconstruction from Syria to Lebanon cuts across two very different kinds of revolutions. The so-called Green Revolution of the Cold War, which is essentially the industrialization of agriculture in the 60s, and the Syrian Revolution, which erupted in 2011 from rural communities that could no longer sustain life under the oppressive Assad regime and its increasingly neoliberal policies. I began to think of seed banks as inheritors of the lineage of botanical gardens in the 18th and 19th centuries, those that assisted the transfer of large amounts of flora from the colonial peripheries or centers to Europe. And therefore, seed banks were a sort of contemporary manifestation of the paradoxes of modernity's archival and taxonomic practices. The paradox being that the bodies in charge of archiving contribute to the erasure of the very th same thing that they claim to preserve. So let's think of seed banks as living archives, large refrigerators which store thousands of samples of crop seeds. They document genetic evol evolution of plants, as well as plant-human co-nurture and codependency. And what I mean by this is that seeds are a result of many, many generations of farmers selecting and cultivating them, and those seeds in turn have also um, informed what we eat and also who we are, what we've evolved into. So this makes them an important resource, the seed banks are an important, re er, important resource of biodiversity today. And yet, the proliferation of these banks was part and parcel of the Green Revolution, a set of technologies that transformed vast parts of the world from traditional agrarian societies to state-coordinated commodi commodity producers through the spread of high-yielding seeds, irrigation systems, and chemical inputs. Few farmers considered the dangers, including health hazards, of the system they were buying into. And it's not like they had many alternatives for making a living anyway. Over time, the biodiversity that was collected from these small farmers' fields and from the wild came to be frozen in the banks and no longer found in the fields. So it's also this model of agriculture that Hafez al-Assad uh, adopted when he was modernizing his country's peasant system when he came to rule uh, in the early 70s. And this was also a way for him to bring rural populations under his control. Entire villages were flooded when dams were, bu were built to increase irrigation capabilities, and peasants were contracted and given quotas for their yields and technological innovations gradually replaced traditional methods. Decades later, mismanagement of underwater resources contributed to the devastating impacts of the drought that preceded the Syrian revolution. So most of my work is invested in making visible the ideologies behind various forms of knowledge production. In, in previous projects, including the film that will be shown here tomorrow, I looked at how the gaze of biblical scholars seeking to restore their fantasy of an ancient Middle East created an artificial freezing of time, relegating Palestine in particular to an imagined past, all the while ignoring the complexity of local societies, forms of knowledge and practice that was right there in front of them. Despite the divisionary and frigid logic of colonial archives, I have looked for the potential of multiplicity and ambiguity in contexts that traditionally promoted a binary worldview. Through Wild Relatives, I'm making the claim that this colonial and orientalist freezing of time also extends to life at large under industrial capitalism through the intended or unintended results of biotechnological processes. And I'm thinking here of what Deborah Bird Rose calls technologies of cryopreservation, and maybe we can talk about this more in the Q&A. So there's something about the totalizing scale of the global food regime that makes it, difficult to, makes it difficult to imagine that other ways are possible. And I don't claim that my film offers any answers. But in Wild Relatives, we do meet an organic farmer uh, and Syrian refugee called Walid, 
who offers an alternative model to the industrial food system. He's just a 10 minute drive from Ikarda, from this international center, and he breeds earthworms and makes compost, exchanges heirloom seeds and practices of knowledge with other organic farmers in the region. This grassroots model is based on practices of education and sustainability rather than merely profit. In the film, I tried to go beyond this dichotomy of biotechnology represented by Ikarda and traditional knowledge of Walid and think from a more uncomfortable position of how we can utilize these existing institutions that we have inherited <laughs> to think about survival, re resilience, and practices of care. And rather than resort to the sublime of mega networks of capitalism or globality, their scale and complexity, I sought to parse out the complicated ways in which locality and globality get intertwined in the matrix of food production and distribution. The intimate encounters and restagings of everyday lives in the film is an attempt to own in from the mega system down to how it impacts the most intimate parts of our bodies, our digestive systems, and our livelihoods. Thank you.